Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Hancock and this is the Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn for the International Humanistic Management Association. We are an association of individuals who are interested in promoting humanistic management, humanistic business management. Um, we have a variety of online forums that we do. We have necessary conversations, a PhD network, the professionals network, um, and we're always interested in more people volunteering, helping us get the word out and doing projects that are humanistically management oriented. My co-host is uh, Elizabeth Castillo. Please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Castillo at Arizona State University. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, and I forgot to mention myself, I run Humanist Learning Systems, and so if you want a certificate of completion at the end, we are, this program today is approved for HRCI business credit, one hour, uh, and SHRM one hour. I also offer a, a general certificate for anybody who's looking to use this for continuing education. We will tell you towards the end how to get that. Today, our guest is Mr. Rob Briner who is involved with the Center for Evidence-Based Management. And we are excited to have him here today to talk to us about that. Rob, welcome. Thank you very much. All right, so um, let's get started. Rob, can you give us about 10-ish minutes um, to kind of give us an overview of this yeah. topic and then we'll start asking questions. Sure, I can give you 10-ish minutes. So uh, <laughs> now I'm trying to share that. Uh, so I can see my slides, you can't, can you see my slides? I'm guessing not. Okay, got it now, yep. Okay, there we go. Great. Okay, so I'm assuming you can see that. Right, thumbs up, okay, good. So yes, I just wanna give a very brief kind of overview about what evidence-based practice and management uh, means. And it's first of all, I think important to mention that underlying evidence-based practice, I guess in any field, are these kinds of principles that managers and including humanistic professionals should ideally be doing stuff that addresses important business organizational problems rather than trivial things, and also do stuff that's more likely to work rather than stuff that's kind of less likely to work. And of course, what are perceived or felt to be important issues and problems could of course include dignity, flourishing, well-being, etc. If you agree that what we should be doing is things that's important and things that's more likely to work, the question is how are we going to do that? The answer to that question or an answer to that question is evidence-based practice or something like it. Because without good quality evidence, we're not going to know what's important. We're also not less likely to know what's more likely to work. So that's the underlying principle. So everything I'll be talking about today is really about those principles. What's important for the business organization in different senses and what's more likely to, to work in terms of getting the outcomes we want. So the kind of uh, elevator pitch about this is that decisions about important problems, opportunities, and most likely solutions should be based on the best available evidence. So for us in management, uh, at the sources of evidence, typically our scientific findings, organizational data, our own expertise as professionals, and also stakeholders, which of course includes employers, customers, et cetera. The key thing about evidence-based practice is everybody uses evidence. So you can't make a decision without using evidence. The key thing seems to be is that we generally pay limited attention to the quality and relevance of evidence. In other words, we're surrounded by information and evidence, but a lot of it may be very poor quality. And secondly, we pay limited attention to different sources of evidence. We may just use one or two, but maybe not three and probably not four. So we always use evidence. That's not the same as adopting an evidence-based approach. And that's a really important thing to bear in mind. So evidence-based practice is a thing. Some of you may have heard of evidence-based medicine, evidence-based education, and all these different fields, these are roughly the dates at which they adopted evidence-based practice as a way of thinking about how they can improve what they do. And I think it's no coincidence that many of these fields are connected actually with human and social welfare and well-being. It's clearly if you're doing things that affect people's welfare and well-being, it's even more important you take an evidence-based approach. I guess, and I think that argument applies today as well to us. So all these different fields have their own centers, including medicine, policing, policy making, uh, conservation, education, etc., aging care, social work, mentoring, and more recently, the Center for Evidence-Based Management, which we set up about, uh, I think, eight or nine years ago. So if you want more materials, www.seven.org is a good place to go to find them. And also, we recently came out with a book from the center describing uh, kind of principles about doing evidence-based management at the end of last year. 
It's also worth as an aside, given we're talking about humanistic stuff, is thinking about the concept of evidence-based philanthropy. I only came into this fairly recently through doing work with charities and looking at human resource management in charities. And I didn't realize, and some of you possibly already all know this, but there's actually quite a movement in evidence-based philanthropy too. So the idea is it's not just about giving money and helping in a vague way. It's actually important to do stuff that's more likely to work. So in philanthropy, there's quite a movement now this is about giving based on sound evidence. I look, give well. This is the idea that if we're going to give money to charities, we should ensure that the charities we're giving them to are themselves evidence based in their practice. A New York Times article about this, et cetera, et cetera. So it's worth noting that in philanthropy, there's actually quite a movement now towards evidence based practice, doing good better. So that's just a kind of aside. So it's worth reflecting on what you think evidence-based practice might mean. How do you define it? Uh, this is the formal definition. Uh, it's not my definition. It's one that's used quite widely across different areas. So it means a conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of evidence from multiple sources. So obviously, conscientious means you try. Explicit means you write it down, codify it, share it in some way. And judicious is judgment, ju judging the quality of it. And it's all about trying to increase the life it's about a process. It is not about certainties, it's about probabilities and likelihoods. So when we take an evidence-based practice approach to a management problem, the best we can say is, given we think this is a particular problem or opportunity we're dealing with, if we take this approach, rather than this approach or that approach, it's more likely we'll get the outcome we want. And this is something I think people often don't realize. They think evidence-based practice is about having a certainty and an answer. It's actually not about that. It's about actually reducing uncertainty more than anything else. So this is, a, uh, I'll go, I'm going to blow it up so you can see it more clearly, but this is a, a, an infographic produced by CIPD, that's a professional body in the UK for HR professionals. And you use this both to identify a problem, and if you think there might be a problem, indeed an opportunity, then you use the same approach to solution. These are the four sources of evidence I mentioned already. And I'll give you an example in a second. There's a definition. And the idea is you should go through a structured approach, something like this. You ask a question, you acquire the evidence, critically appraise its quality, you pull it together, you aggregate it, you apply it, and then you assess to increase the likelihood of a favorable outcome. So I'm just going to give you one example, which I think many of you will be uh, familiar with, employee engagement. I assume everybody knows what employee engagement is, right? I'm still trying to work it out after 10 years, but uh, people think they know what it is. And it's quite a common concern, I think, in a lot of HR. So these are lots of examples of kind of popular books about extra mile, engaged, chief engagement officer, even employee engagement for dummies, employee engagement, engagement for everyone, not just for dummies, uh, for engagement 2.0 and so on. So there's a lot, it's a very popular idea within management and HR. And this is probably the best known commercial measure of employee engagement, the Gallup Q12, which again, I think some of you have possibly heard of. So if we were in a management team and our organization believed we had low engagement, low employee engagement, we thought it was a problem, how should we measure it? How should we look at it from an evidence-based point of view and try and increase scores? What kinds of questions would we ask? So I'm just going to give you a little example now and then kind of conclude. These are some of the questions you would ask in a group, in a team, to try and understand this issue. So again, they're the four areas, but let's look at the first area, our own expertise. We would say, have we seen employee engagement problems before? What happened? What do we think? Based on our experience, is the level of employee engagement a problem? What do we think of the causes and consequences of this? And if we think it is a problem, again, the same process about solution. What do we think the solution might be? What have we seen before? What does that, our experience tell us? And for every single source of evidence, we always say how relevant, applicable, and trustworthy is that source of evidence, in this case, expertise. Second area is organizational data. What actually is the engagement level? Are measures of engagement valid and reliable? The data show how engagement is causing problems. So for example, can we see that over time when engagement goes up, for example, Maybe employee absence goes down, or when engagement goes down, does performance go down? We see links between engagement and particular things that might be important to the organizations. If it is a problem, then what about a solution? What, what are we already doing to try and enhance engagement? Are there relationships between engagement and other data that might give us a clue? And again, how relevant, applicable, and trustworthy are our data? Third source, scientific evidence. Again, we might look for systematic reviews of evidence to try and say, what are the problems with low engagement? Are there, is there lots of good evidence there, not much evidence? And if there is, and it suggests it's a problem, what do we know from systematic reviews of, of evidence that tells us what we can do to actually increase engagement? Again, how relevant, applicable, and trustworthy are our findings. Fourthly, stakeholder concerns. 
which again might be particularly relevant to us here today, I suppose, but how do employees feel about and view this engagement problem? If we talk to them, do they kind of recognize it? Do they see it as something else? When we talk to them, do they say, well, we're not, it's not that we're disengaged, it's just because we're managed very poorly, or it's not because we're disengaged, it's because we're just not, we don't have the resources to do our work, or whatever it happens to be. Do they see negative consequences? What do managers think about this apparent problem? Do customers or clients have a view? If you talk to customers and clients and say, we feel we've got a problem with employee engagement, do they see it or do they not see it? If, there, if it does appear to be a problem from the stakeholder's perspective, then what do stakeholders think about possible solutions? And again, how relevant, applicable and trustworthy is that evidence? So, I mean, obviously we can discuss this in a second, but does it broadly make sense? I think most people kind of think it does. It looks like a lot of work, but actually you can do this very quickly if you want to. I think concerns are also where we don't have the evidence, we don't have the data, is it worth doing? Again, we can discuss that. Is it doable? And again, one, uh, one thing I always say to people, yes, it is doable. You can, you can just allocate a certain amount of time for doing it. Because even if you only have a day to do it, the argument is you're still likely to make a better informed decision even if you only have a day to do it than not doing it. So the point is it's not about perfection, it's about making better informed decisions. So having said that, there's a big paradox here that around evidence-based management and evidence-based practice. People don't actually disagree with the idea of making more informed decision, but what is quite easy to observe, I think, it just doesn't happen much at all. And I've got quite interested in some of the barriers that people and organizations experience. This is a whole range of them, and I'm not going to go into all of these. I'm just going to talk about one, which is misconceptions, and then I'll conclude. So this is just an example of the barriers that, that we face to trying to do evidence-based practice in management. There's general misconceptions of what it means. People sometimes think they can't use their experience, so they feel that it's going to be people with data telling them what to do. And I hope I made it very clear that isn't what evidence-based practice is. People also feel that evidence tells you the truth, you can prove things. And of course it doesn't, it's just information. Science can't prove things. Science is about the truth. Science is just provisional guesses about what seems to be going on in the world, anything that could come along later that might disprove it. So we're not trying to get at truth and the proof, we're trying to make a better informed decision. But if people have that as a bar, then they're never gonna kind of get into it, I think. People also feel it's about making perfectly informed decisions. It isn't. Also, people sometimes feel gathering all the evidence will give you the answer. And of course, as most of us have experienced, the more we find out about something, actually don't have an answer. We have more confusion, more complexity, which you could see as a failure, or you could see that we just learned something about what we're doing. The other barrier, I think, is people think they're doing it already. So I have a regular, probably quarterly, a Twitter discussion with people, and I say, who's doing evidence-based practice? Lots of people say they are. I send them the infographic I've just shown to you, and I say, are you sure you're doing this? They are absolutely, sometimes I arrange to meet them or have a phone call with them. And so far, they've never been doing it. People feel they're doing it, even if they're not. And I think it's important then to see the differences. I think there's three main differences between what we already do with evidence, evidence-based practice. The first main difference is the approach. Conscientious, explicit, judicious. It's a whole approach to using evidence. The second difference is multiple sources, both to triangulate, but also to contextualize look across at least three or four different sources. So we do tend to use evidence, but probably not from that many sources. The third difference is a structures and stepped approach, where we actually go step by step through this process and try to stay on track. And the reason for that is it's very, very easy to get distracted and follow our biases and hunches instead of focusing on the evidence. So I think that's the difference between what, the way we already use evidence and evidence-based practice. So there's also, I think, some particular conceptions of the role of science in evidence-based HR, particularly at the moment, the idea that breakthrough studies are the most important or single scientific studies are important, that science published in peer-reviewed journals can be important or automatically trusted, that science is the highest quality evidence compared to the sources. No, it isn't. The scientists themselves are reliable sources of scientific evidence, and of course they're not because they're biased like everybody else. Data you collect and studies done with an organization are not science, but of course they can be. And you see expressions like science shows, studies find, we know from science. No, 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 that's not, that's the sort of misconception of the nature of science. So people often think evidence-based practice is about science. It isn't. Science is one of a number of sources of information. And there are problems, of course, with science as there are with every other source of evidence. So just to conclude, how can we become more evidence-based? I think spend more time getting evidence about real business problems and opportunities and dealing with those, so more diagnosis and less intervention. Ask why a lot, more humility and honesty about what we know and don't know. More of our own evaluations where we don't have evidence, less solutioneering, so solutions in search of problems, less defining our 
problem by the absence of a solution we already thought of. I think more skepticism, management is full of fads and so is HR. Use evidence-based practice decision support, such as the infographic I showed you, to help us stay on track with using it. So what are the disadvantages? Well, there are quite a lot. Uh, challenges, beliefs, prejudices about projects. It's harder work. It does require you getting more data. It makes it hard to follow fads and it challenges authority and power based on hierarchy. Because I say so, or just freaking do it. Or hippo decision making, which stands for highest paid person's opinion. The idea that when people are making group decision, they can't get anywhere, that all eyes turn to the highest paid person and ask them what they think. It gets you away from that, which some people don't like, and it also reduces the action orientation of management. I think these disadvantages can also be seen as advantages, and I would say they're all advantages for my way of thinking. The second advantage, I think, it develops a much deeper knowledge and understanding of work, what you're actually doing, the context, the organisation, the skills you have, the knowledge you're trying to use to make a difference in your organisation and in your work. It develops essential skills and fundamentally, I think it's really the only way we can do stuff that's important and stuff that's more likely to work. And that's kind of my argument. Thank you. Thank you for that, Rob. That was um, a really, really good overview. As I was listening to you, I was thinking, you know, this is why I come out of the, the philosophic humanist movement and we spend almost all our time talking about critical thinking, skepticism, mm. um, science-based approaches to problem solving and all of that because and you're right, it's not a single thing. It's kind of a combination of skills and processes that help you be less wrong. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. therefore more right. Like, you know. Yes, exactly. And the goal isn't to be right. The goal is to be less wrong. Yes, indeed. Right. And over time, the less wrong you are, the more successful you end up. Yeah. Being, right. Yeah. So um, let, me, let me start with some questions, though. The first obvious kind of elephant in the room is, uh, and we talked about this earlier in the week, is that this process is value neutral. And as mm. humanistic business managers, we're absolutely not value ne neutral. Yeah. We have very strong values sure. uh, that we would like to see implemented. So how does, how does, how and does evidence-based practice help us implement our values? Um, or are there yeah. situations where it would maybe hurt? Yeah, I think, I think it does, because as, as I mentioned, in terms of saying what is important for this organization and what do we believe is important and also what is important to stakeholders, and that would include ourselves and our colleagues, that's where the values come in. So if you, for example, in your organization value something like uh, treating people with respect, whatever that means, you could say that is a very important thing for us. We think that's very important. But then you would still take the same approach to say, what's the evidence that people do not feel respected? What does that mean? What exactly is the nature of this problem or issue? And similarly, what's the evidence we can do something about it? So evidence comes in in terms of defining the problem. It also comes in, of course, say when we're using gathering stakeholder evidence, because it, it depends what people think and feel about that particular value. So I think you could, you can, it's quite easy to incorporate values that we may believe are positive and also incorporate values may think are negative into this process. So in that sense, it is sort of, yeah, value neutral, as you say, but you can incorporate values into it quite straightforwardly, I think. So I guess the next question is, there was uh, a while back a movement for, um, you know, just measure, measuring things. We're going to measure yeah. a return on investment. We're going to measure this output. Um, there are certain really high profile companies that measure how much time their employees are in the bathroom to like, sure. to try and make them more effective. It's like a really yeah. me mechanistic mm. way of management. Um, is evidence-based management related to that? And I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. But is it yeah. related to that or is it something, is it a different use of information? I think it's, I, yeah, I think it's a completely different use of information. So if you take the idea of measuring things like bathroom breaks and those kinds of things and using it to sort of try and control people, I would say that kind of approach in itself isn't very scientific. Even if you wanted to take that approach to doing it, that's actually not a very good way of doing it. So if you wanted to control people, that's a pretty poor way of doing it. And secondly, I think, yeah, there's often, I think, a bit of confounding or confusion between the evidence being meaning, oh, it's just stuff you can measure. That's evidence, that's it. Well, of course, I hope I made clear it isn't. Evidence is all kinds of things. And even things you think you can measure, it doesn't mean those measurements are important, like, for example, employee engagement measures. So you can measure stuff, but is it important? That's something you need to find out. 
So I think it, it, it's the idea that measurement itself is, is sort of significantly important. It's something that absolutely is not the case in every place practice. It depends what those measures are telling you, if they're valid and reliable and relevant and so on. So yeah, I, don't, I think it's a different it's a different thing. It's sort of pseudo scientific management, I would say. Oh I, yeah, I I would agree with you, and I love the idea of it being pseudo intellectual science as opposed to because you're right. They don't. There's assumptions that get made about what people think is important, and they never bother to actually find out whether what they think is important really is important using evidence. Right? There's sure. some goal that they think this is going to help them with, but it it's that little piece is yeah. not really going to help yeah. them get there. They just think it will. Yeah. And so then they focus on that to the exclusion of other things. Um, can we stop sharing your screen real quick? And then, you know, if we need to come back to it, we can. Okay. Um, the next question I have um, has to do with um, you, the Center for Evidence-Based Management puts out um, summaries of evidence on certain things. And this is one of the reasons you came to my attention. Um, sure. It had to do with diversity, the, the sorts of papers you put out on diversity inclusion, mm -hmm. um, the, the cognitive, bi does cognitive bias training really work? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you all decide as an organization what evidence to look at to produce these summaries for? Right. So the center itself doesn't actually produce too many summaries. One organization that does is an organization called Science for Work. Uh, what Science for Work does is it, is it gets hold of what they feel are reasonable good quality things like meta-analyses that seem to match with the, the issues and questions people sort of have. And then they try and summarize them and produce infographics in a more accessible way. The center itself has done some sort of systematic reviews, but they're often things that, that, our, that I guess our customers and clients want us to do and if they do want us to do we normally kind of agree that that should be public domain so we did one for example on performance appraisal biases in performance appraisal so it's a combination of of what people are interested in and also sort of the quality of the evidence that's there but sometimes of course it's really important for people are interested in the topic to actually make it clear well there isn't much evidence here scientific evidence. so that's just as important as, as if there is as well so I think we try and do it also not just by driving, oh, there's good evidence you need to know about it, this push approach, but more of a pull approach. What's important questions to you? What do we know and not know about that question? So it, let me kind of rephrase mm -hmm. that and make sure I understood yeah. that yeah. it's just as important to know what doesn't work and doesn't have evidence as yeah. it is to know what there is evidence for. Yeah, in, ter in, ter in, terms of, in terms of the one source of evidence you're talking about, which is scientific evidence, for sure, yes. A systematic review tells, tells you what we know and what we don't know. And within that, there might be stuff about what works and what doesn't, sure. But the most important thing is what do we, what do we feel we know with reasonable confidence and what are the gaps in our knowledge? So knowing what we don't know is, is kind of equally important, I think, yeah. So um, one of the things to, that comes up a lot is, you know, what does the evidence tell us about effective ways of changing behavior? Because a lot of the times we have people coming on, uh, we're talking about maybe, you know, self-managed organizations or, you know, whatever the topic is, um, ethical wages and good jobs, but we're talking about creating cultural shifts within our organizations and practical ways Mm. That it always comes down to behavior. How do we actually get yeah. people to change? So is, is there, I mean, do you have anything, any knowledge to impart? Well, no, because I'd say I need to do a systematic review of the evidence. And, and I'm very, uh, I basically say I just don't know until I've done a systematic review. I don't know. Uh, but I do know that that question about yeah, behavior and behavior change is a very big one. It's very important. Uh, and it, I think it's quite a good example of a question that's too big. It's too vague. So if you remember this sort of, the sort of four areas, the six steps. If you started off with what brings about behavior change, it's just way too broad. And of course, if you start talking across all the scientific evidence about that, you never ever stop. So if people ask that question, I always, I always encourage them to try and think more specifically, what is the question they're actually trying to answer for them in their context and their situation? And quite often it isn't that question, it's something else. It's to do with, oh, we think people are resisting change or people won't do what we want or, uh, why are people doing the wrong things instead of the thing, the right, you know, whatever it is. So I think it's much more important to be very focused on what, what kind of behavior you mean and what you mean by change. And then you can start looking at scientific evidence, but also importantly, there's other sources of evidence. 
audience as well. But it's difficult to do with, with the questions that, that broad. It's like saying, how do you manage organisational change? Or what motivates people? That, that you can't really get any traction with those kinds of things, that I find. So it, that reminds me of, I think, it was it Einstein who said, if you give me an hour to solve a problem, I'll spend 15 right. minutes defining the question? Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. so one of the many things Einstein probably never said was something like that, either minutes or hours. Or the yeah. one I, if, you, if you 24 hours to save the world, I'd spend 22 hours diagnosing the problem, two hours trying to fix the problem. And I think management in general, I'm generalizing this anecdote on HR2, it tends to be reversed that ratio, it's sort of two, two hours diagnosis and 22 hours equivalent implementing solutions. So I think that, and that's a very, uh, that's almost like a bias, a bias for action. And actually, because it's just, it's harder work trying to understand what the problem or opportunity might be. People often want to move very, very quickly onto what should we do, let's implement it. Because that's kind of fun and it feels positive. Uh, and when we do training on this, we often sort of will get people to think about the problems and issues they're facing and say, today or this morning, we're not allowed to talk about solutions. No talk about solutions, only talk about what do we think the problem or issue actually is. And that's extremely difficult for us to do because we just want to move on. We feel, we feel we're getting stuck thinking about the problem. But of course, as you know, the challenge is if you just implement stuff without knowing what the problem is, there's a vague chance it might work, but it's extremely unlikely. And you're going to waste resources and time and effort and just have to do it again anyway. So I think focusing on the issue is so important. Preach, baby. Preach. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Elizabeth, um, I know I've been seeing some questions pop up in the chat room. Shall we start with some of those? Yes, that sounds great. And I'm going to start with Sergio Rivas Isla, who says, um, well, what about industries that are very new, such as social media companies? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things you talked about was the value of doing a meta analysis or a literature yeah. review, but if it's an emerging and, um, yeah. field, what would you recommend there? Right. So that's a really good question from Sergio. So people do feel that somehow if, if an industry is particularly new, that there's going to be no published science that's relevant to it. However, if you look across a whole range of topics, such as motivation at work and how people use knowledge and how people work in teams, unless there's a good reason to assume it's fundamentally different, there's no reason why some of those exactly same principles and those, that those research findings won't apply to sort of new contexts as well. They may not, but that's why it's crucial to also look at organizational data as well to say, okay, we think there's this research from these contexts which seems to be showing this effect in these findings. Is it going to apply to our situation? So I think you can't decide before whether or not it's relevant. I think you need to look at the scientific evidence and then discount it or include it based on your understanding of the context. But, you're right, but Sergio is absolutely right. People do feel that, well, this is new, this is different. It, everything we know doesn't apply to this. And that's pretty unusual, actually. Because the things about organisations and people, I suspect, haven't changed much for probably thousands of years, really, the basic stuff. Uh, great, thank you. Um, Sherry McClary has a question, um, and it gets back to this problem framing. Uh, yeah. uh, it says, can Rob talk more about the diagnostic approach? Um, often we're looking for a solution to a problem, but we're asking the wrong questions because we've not performed the correct diagnostic. Yeah. So, uh, what would be some processes that evidence-based management um, uses to get to the right framing? Yeah. Okay, so what, what, a couple of I've sort of mentioned a bit, but I'll elaborate a little bit on this. So one is the first thing is, is saying we're going to stick with understanding the problem or opportunity first. We're not allowed to resist talking about solutions. Just just don't even let it enter the conversation uh, and actually focus on that for a whole bat and keep, keep with that for a while. And I think the other thing is to follow something like the six-step approach and looking at different sources of evidence, say what is the problem that's going on here. So just as a recent example, uh, diversity and inclusion is a really good example where people see a problem. And then they go, what is the problem? The conversation I had recently with someone, they said, the problem is there aren't enough black and white minority ethnic managers at this level. And so well, why is that a problem? They just said, it is a problem. Going, well, but why is it a problem? And I think that really got to a really interesting conversation. I think about, well, what, what does that tell you? Because if you did diagnose that as the problem, what you will do is just try and fix the numbers. And again, with diversity inclusion, it's fairly clear that just fixing the numbers doesn't really fix very much, or it fixes it in the very short term. So it's a good example where you have to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, like, what actually is the problem with this, uh, and, just, and just hold on to that. So, and I think you can do it, you can keep going. It's quite frustrating. It's better to do it for a while, walk away, leave it, go back to it again. But having this line between what's the problem or issue, what's the solution, I think is also is key to that. 
Great, thank you. Um, so Gemma's asking, um, how do um, people that want to have evidence-based approach in the workplace yeah. uh, push back against consultancy companies that come in and right. promote fad solutions? And yeah. this I think you see in philanthropy all the yes. time, the flavor of the month, best Indeed. practice. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, th I think fads and fashions in management is one of the major barriers to evidence-based practice. I think in part because it encourages solutioneering. Uh, you know, the problem is we don't have that practice, which will make like agile, whatever it happens to be, which will make everything all right again. And indeed, consultancies, not, and obviously it's not about blaming them individually, but for, often for them, it's part of their business model. So they'll develop a product or service and they'll develop all kinds of things around it, like training and apps and measures, whatever they do in processes. And then they'll sell it to all the customers and clients or everybody's bought it and the market is saturated. And then they'll have to think of a new thing. And then they'll do the same again and again and again and again. So the, the business model of some consultancies is like that. However, again, back to the question, I think the consumers are also responsible. So the question is, why do consumers keep buying this stuff? And I think part of the reason is, is maybe they're not particularly savvy consumers. Maybe the reason they're buying it is because they're just kind of copying other people. Maybe they are rewarded for doing the latest thing instead of for doing what works. And I think it is quite hard to fight back against it. What I would say, if consultancies are coming to your organization to try and sell you stuff, I do recommend actually just asking them for the evidence. Just say to them, why, why, why do you think this works in general? What was the evidence? Why do you think it will work here? And, and quite often those questions are enough to scare people away because they, actually, they don't usually have the answers to that. So, and that gives you a clue as well. If they can't answer those basic questions and they're not comfortable asking them, probably shouldn't be working with them anyway. Can I follow up on that question? Um, one of the things you said earlier had to do with you know, asking the question, why? And yeah. so with consultants, I, I'm always kind of wondering, do they even know what my problem is that I'm trying to solve? Sure. Right, do yeah. they even understand what it is I'm trying to solve? And so yeah. asking them or, or doing a better job of defining what what my outcome, my desired outcome is, help me to avoid charlatans in the form of consultants. Yeah, I think- I'm not I think, to say consultants are bad, but you know. No, 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 no. I think, I mean, again, it depends on the consultants. So some obviously are different. They might be process consultants, they might do diagnosis too, but for those who are actually selling products and services and their main interest is getting you to buy that product or service, uh, I think it's worth asking them what specific problems or issues they think it's appropriate for and then actually sort of say, well, we don't, you know, we don't actually know if we've got those problems. We're not even sure we have them. And why would this thing work better than what we're doing already or other kinds of stuff? So I think in terms of, in terms of outcomes and interventions, I, I would always push back, push people back to what's the problem. Not, not how cool is your solution, not how many companies use it, not how wonderful is it, but how's it going to help us? And can you actually show that given our particular context and problems? And again, if they can't do that or can't engage with that, that probably tells you something. Great. And um, thank you, Rob. Um, t now, Tina has sort of a related question, uh, mm -hmm. Tina Sahakian. She says, hello, uh, what skills and competencies would managers need to adopt an evidence-based approach when making decisions? And yeah. So, uh, you know, your mindset or your aptitudes, your competencies, and then I will expand that to what kind of organizational culture do you need? Yes. So that's a good point. So, yeah, I think there are individual things that the individual managers might need. Uh, and in fact, the Centre for Evidence-Based Management, we have lots of online courses. I mentioned the book as well. So typically those skills are around critical thinking, already mentioned quite, quite already. Uh, critical thinking, I think it's around asking good questions. And I think connected to that is once you get evidence and information, the skills of judging is quality. So it's not quite like, it's a bit like the stuff that's around now, been around for a few years about fake news. So there's lots of popular videos, accounts, websites to help people think about, can I believe this or not, or how much should I believe it? And it's skills like that. And they, I think they're pretty trainable, and quite learnable through looking at multiple examples of here's a piece of information for a scientific study or for some organizational data, whatever it happens to be. Here's a claim. Can you really trust that claim and how much can you make it? But again, I think your supplementary question is interesting because, because I think you're onto something there very important that even if individuals have that skill, even if the team has that skill, if there aren't, isn't a sort of culture, I want for a better word, a way of, 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 of those evidence-based practice behaviors are rewarded, not punished, 
then it's never going to work. So the centre, and personally, I get approached, you know, quite frequently by individual managers and individual HR managers who say, thank God I found your website because I'm, I'm just dying here. I'm trying to get us to do things based on evidence. And I thought I was going crazy because people just keep wanting to do these fads, not interested in problems. So, there is a, so it's not just me who wants to try and do this and I'm so relieved. So often it's the lone wolf. And the lone wolf just can't get very far. So it's a question of saying, what do you reward managers for doing? So my sense is that the incentives for managers are often about doing stuff, doing things quickly, maybe being quite good politically, uh, do, you know, bringing people with you, all that kind of stuff, which is okay. But they're very rarely about, does what you do actually either, one, address important business problems, and two, is it effective compared to something else? So the effectiveness of what you're doing, whether it's important or not, is not so much in there in terms of what people are rewarded for. And again, what also goes along with that is being evidence-based means challenging authority sometimes, and as it were, speaking truth to power. And again, that's quite uncomfortable, and exactly the kind of thing in some contexts might be not actually very much valued and actually punished. So I think it is about individual manager skills, the original question, but back to your question, your supplementary question, it is also about saying, there's no point in doing this if we don't create a context in which this is supported. Um, and building on that, have you seen any cases or people that you've worked with, organizations that have managed to make that culture shift? Um, and I'm thinking about practices such as action research in the K-12 mm. education domain. Yeah or um, developing this learning organization mindset sure. for Peter Senge, so. Yeah, so what, what I've seen is people do bits of it. So I've seen people be quite successful, like with the Priesthood Inquiry, doing, doing parts of this, uh, but then missing out other parts completely. So yes, I've seen organizations that are not bad at doing parts of it. I've seen a couple of organizations that tr are trying to do all of it, and, and it's generally, difficult to create a culture around that because it depends on, like I know some HR departments who've been trying to do this, but it does depend on getting everyone kind of involved and understanding this is important. And again, if the senior person is being, say, rewarded for doing things fast and for getting things to happen, they're gonna feel that you're slowing everything down and that's not helping them. Even if slowing it down in the end will lead to more effective organization, and lead to the outcomes you want, their short-term goals are about getting stuff done. So I have seen example, good examples of people doing parts of it. I've seen few examples of people successfully doing all of it. And one argument is that the people most senior in organizations, again, it depends on the organizations. You have to ask the question, did those people right at the top get there by being evidence-based? The answer is probably no. They got there by wanting power, wanting authority, and having all those kind of political skills and making things happen. So they... Sadly, it may be the case that many of those at the top of organizations are exactly the people that might find evidence-based practice quite a threat to their authority. But that's not all organizations, and hopefully it's changing. Great, thank you. Can I, can I do a follow-up on that? Um, what I was thinking when you were talking about that is, is that's the central challenge of um, people concerned with humanistic yeah. management, right? Yeah. Is we're trying to change the metrics by which success in business is mm. defined at a very high level because if we don't do that then the trickle down effect throughout an organization is not about um what a, no one's even having a discussion about what a good outcome is you know ideally right yeah. at the various levels of the organization so it, it was very interesting you know and how do we use that how do we get this up up so that it can be throughout and not just a yeah. lone wolf saying hey we should make decisions based on something other than who's the loudest in the room and who's the biggest bully i think what can help a little bit is, is keeping reminding people from the top, bottom to the top let's try and do things that are important not trivial stuff and let's do stuff that's more likely to work and because it, it's, it's a piece of rhetoric in a way but most people seem to agree with that because we, we all know probably most of us had experiences in jobs where we spent a long time doing things in the end, we're not sure they're really very important to anyone. I was a long time doing things and then we're probably not too sure it's really made any difference. And in the end, that's quite frustrating. So I think most, for most people, it's appealing, the idea of trying to focus on important stuff, uh, focusing on what's more likely to sort of have the outcome you want. And I think, I think that, that can help to remind people constantly, let's not just do stuff. You know, let's, not, let's just stop doing stuff. Let's actually think about what we're trying to do. I think that can maybe help a little bit. 
Great, thank you, Rob. Um, so Baba has a question. Um, who decides what the questions are deserving of an SR? And I'm not sure what SR means. Okay. And how? Hi, Baba. Hello. Yeah, so systematic review is basically a methodology for reviewing the scientific literature. And I'm just going to repeat, scientific evidence is only one of four sources. Okay, so I'm not privileging it, but just to be asked, asked that question. So systematic review is a way, of, is a method for rather than just doing a traditional literature review where you just look around, you find some articles or whatever you're interested in, you throw them in the review, you make some comments about them, maybe critique them and summarize. Systematic review is a method for actually trying to find the best available evidence around any particular question. So you follow a particular sort of series of steps. They evolved actually probably in psychology a long time ago. They've been used in medicine and many other fields since, including policy making, policing, et cetera, et cetera. So his question was, how do you decide on the question? Well, I think it depends. So it depends on the context. So in some contexts, like policing, for example, I know that they often decide to do systematic reviews based on what they think their frontline officers think is most important. It could be politically what's most important. It could be, say, for more broad if an organization about problems we think are sort of important social problems. So for example, the sense has recently been involved in one on unethical behavior at work. So looking at all kinds of things from sort of banking and other kinds of contexts where people sort of are behaving badly. And the question might be, this is quite an important issue, but what, are, what do we know about are the causes of these kinds of bad behaviors? And what do we know about interventions to actually deal with them? So I think it's driven a bit by a different thing, particular needs of employees, maybe political needs, but also more broader social issues around what do we think socially is important in terms of what's going on in organizations. So I think there's a different range of answers for how we get to those questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Michelle Machado wants to know, um, how do you see that the evidence-based approach could be best used in the teaching and learning process in management schools? Ah, okay, great question. So this is, so in general, I would say the business and management schools, and this, you know, it sounds a bit negative. I think they're part of the problem. They're not part of the solution. Because historically, they haven't been very good at teaching these sorts of skills, even though, you know, if you ask employers, they often say critical thinking, using evidence and data, are really valued skills. Quite often what business schools do is, is sort of try to make, it depends on the kind of course, but they often try and make students into kind of mini academics. So they ask them to do dissertations and collect new primary data and stuff that they're probably never going to do in their job. So I would say what business and management education, if you want to do it from an evidence-based practice perspective, it should be about focusing, if you think about the model, it should be focusing on specific kinds of business issues, problems, and opportunities, and organizational opportunities, and starting there. And actually teaching students the skills to gather evidence and critically appraise it from all those sources. So again, rather than saying, here's your course on organizational behavior, here's your course on marketing, here's your course, it's all kind of siloed, and it's all have this knowledge, learn it, regurgitate an exam, have a mark, goodbye, well done. It'd be much more, no, you're going to use the scientific knowledge with other forms of knowledge to try and understand what's going on in these contexts and also to make decisions about what to do. So I think it is quite possible to, in a sense, turn what a business education on its head. It's less about giving people content and it's more about giving them evidence-based practice skills. And of course, in doing that, they will learn both scientific content theory, but they will also learn stuff about how to use other kinds of data as well. So I think it's, I think it's entirely possible, and I teach some courses like that. There's, there's a few people around the world teaching courses like this to teach a lot of management from evidence-based practice principles. Great, thank you. So kind of turn education on its head, huh? So yeah. Um, so Gemma has a, a question from a kind of a consultant's perspective. Mm. A company comes to you asking for solutions and interventions to a problem that they've identified. How do yes. you, as an outsider uh, yeah. of a co company, help push the company to ensure that they have diagnosed the issue correctly? Yes. This, this is a brilliant question. So my sort of disciplinary background is IO psychology, and I hear this a lot from my psychology consultants in particular and practitioners. They will say, look, Companies come to us and say, can you run an assessment center? And if we say to them, why do you want an assessment center? What's the, what you're trying to do selection wise? What's the problem or issue? They will say, well, we just want an assessment center. Can you do it or not? So a lot of practitioners feel quite frustrated that they are asked to just to do stuff without being an opportunity to actually diagnose the problem. Now, not only is that an issue around ethics, because you could say as a psychologist or any kind of consultant, why would you 
implement some solution without understanding the problem. That's not really very ethical, as well as being unlikely to be effective. So the question was how to sort of push back and, and get into that. Well, it comes back to these two questions again. I th and, and what I would say to say to potential clients is, look, I can do an assessment center, but would you prefer to actually find out what, whether there's an important problem or issue here? And if there is one, what the best solution might be. It may turn out to be an assessment center. It may turn out not to be. It may be cheaper. It may be more expensive. But it really depends on understanding what you're trying to do. And indeed, some clients and customers may say, don't care, just give me the assessment center. There's 400 people that can do it if you're not interested. So it sort of it depends what you want to do. And people have told me who do this successfully, it's the old cliche, it's because they've gone back, back and back to the same client over years, two, three, four years later, they say, oh, you know that thing you mentioned about trying to understand the problem first? Yeah, I think I'd like to do that now. So it comes through learning that just doing lots and lots and lots of stuff is maybe very kind of beneficial. So I think it's partly about that idea of kind of what in the first course, educating clients and persuading them to, I think, to focus on it, on what, what really is important to them rather than just implementing something. But it's a great question, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, real quick, Elizabeth, um, sure. we're about 15 minutes towards the end. Um, if anybody is interested in getting a certificate of completion, we need in the chat room your name, your email, and what certificates you want. We have an HRCI business certificate, um, business credit, SHRM, and general. So we need your name, your email, and what certificates you would like us to send you. Um, and just put that in the chat room. Elizabeth? Okay, great. Um, Sherry has just popped in a question. Sherry McClary, again, uh, where does systematic thinking come into play? Um, looking at the entire organization rather than just kind of a siloed departmental thing. And yeah. I think about the metaphor of the people in a dark room looking at an elephant sure. and they're all touching different parts and think they understand what an elephant is. Yeah, I think, yeah, I th again, a really good question from Sherry. I, th I think to me, this is almost the antithesis of that sort of siloed thinking in that it may be once you start to identify an organizational problem, you may be in the marketing department, you may be in the HR department. Once you get into it, you may think, you know what, this is, this is not an HR issue. This is actually a facilities management issue, or this is to do with a completely different department, or this is just to do with three departments. So you, the idea is you approach these problems and solutions in an agnostic way. You don't go into them saying, oh, this is a marketing issue. This is an HR issue. You go to them saying, no, this is a business organizational issue. Which function fixes it? Which, which is most appropriate? Different question. And even which function is best place to understand it? Different question. So in a sense, it's kind of a level above all those functions because in the end, of course, all these functions should be in the service of doing what is important for the organization. That's what they're there for, not to sort of justify their own existence. So yes, it's very much sort of taking out of that functional area and saying, what is the problem? What's the issue? So even if it's a manufacturing problem, the solutions to understanding that might be nothing to do with the manufacturing department. It might be another department. So in that sense, yes, it's about being agnostic about, about that. Yeah. Um, and I'll throw in a, my own question. Um, how do you prevent the evidence from becoming constraining or prescriptive or out of touch? Like they say today's problem was yesterday's solution. Yeah. I um, mean, where metrics can become a chain rather than... Um... Sure. Yeah, I think, okay, so it depends on the nature of the problem. I think, uh, I think as, I said, as I said before, I think, I think people think things change in the economic world and business or faster than they actually really do, for one thing. Uh, and also, I think there's more generalizations that you can apply across organizations that generally people believe. People think their organization is unique, they're their sector is unique, their department is unique, their boss is unique. Well, sure, but it doesn't mean there aren't some generalizations there. Uh, and also, yeah, if, if there is a concern that things have moved on, such that the evidence and information you've got is no longer valid, well, that's quite, it's something that's quite easy to test. You don't have to accept it. So there might be evidence from some time ago. You can just say, is this still relevant? Because the whole point about any source of evidence you look at, you always have to ask, is it relevant? Is it trustworthy? And can I use it here? So I think you can deal with it quite directly through this process. You're not hampered by it. You don't have to believe in it forever. You don't have to use it forever. You get more information if it's no longer relevant. Can okay. I follow up on that real quick? So how do, we, how do we as humanistic managers make sure that evidence isn't being used to oppress the people in our organizations? <laughs> you know, how do we make yeah. sure that, 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 that we're using evidence in a way that lifts right. up and empowers people sure. as opposed to being used to oppress them. 
Okay, well, the first thing I'll say is that I think evidence in itself cannot oppress anybody. <laughs> I think it's not the evidence or information, it's people that tend to do that and systems that tend to do that. So the evidence in itself can't be sort of blamed for this in many sense, but, it, but, it, but it's, it's people themselves. And I think it's, it, as humanistic managers, I think it's, it's probably to focus on the, you know, the key issues about things like thriving and flourishing and respect and think about what do those really mean? And I think one of my concerns around sort of some kind of ideas around humanistic management and indeed philanthropy and other kinds of things is people criticize it for being a bit kind of fluffy and a bit vague. And actually, I think some of those criticisms are actually quite valid. So if we're talking about things like respect and dignity at work, you know, how much do we really know about what that means and what it means to different people and how you, you can check people have that or not and why that isn't working. And you know, So I think there's still lots and lots of questions to ask about that. So I'll say from a humanistic management perspective, any values perspective, I think translating those values into answerable questions is also very much part of it, just as it is in, say, evidence-based philanthropy. It's fine saying we need to help, here's some resources, that doesn't do anything. Similarly, it's fine to say we need to treat people with respect and help them flourish, that doesn't do anything. How can we translate these values into sort of actionable, evidence-based sort of processes and decisions and behaviours? You just like answered the reason why our group exists. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> like that's that's entirely like what the association is is trying okay. to do. So um, is find evidence to find out whether or not you know what are the processes do they even work yeah. do they help all of that it's i mean elizabeth do you want to add anything <laughs> no just to hit the nail on the head thank you so much for singing our song um okay what well, one thing i would say because we've touched on it a few times as well i think you know in different ways one thing i'm very i'm very concerned about is, is the business case arguments the business case arguments for doing the right thing and you get this certainly in some context with things like mental health at work or well-being at work or diversity inclusion and I'm very, very worried about those kinds of arguments. If you take diversity and inclusion, okay, it's complicated, what does it mean, et cetera, et cetera, but there are some values behind it. The problem, of course, with making a business case, and diversity is a good example of this, is if you look at the evidence about whether diversity really helps organizations or not, whatever that happens to mean, whatever kind of diversity you're talking about, often the evidence is pretty mixed. And sometimes the evidence suggests that diversity may not help performance. The question then is, do we just say that we're not going to do diversity anymore? So I think we have to draw a really clear line between things we're doing, and it goes back to what the, what the issue is, what, what the problem is, what the opportunity is. We might say, we're going to do diversity because we think it's right, not because it's going to improve business. That's not what we're doing it for. And I think there's a real danger sometimes when people attach, say, business cases. So, I mean, what I often say is sort of the business case for doing the morally right thing is, bank, is morally bankrupt because it gets us into all kinds of troubles. And I think sometimes we can just be a bit bolder and say, no, we're not doing it for a business case. We're doing it for a different kind of case, but it's just as important. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, oh, so Baba has another question. Um, Rob, Hi, Baba. How do we incorporate context in generating usable evidence? So ensuring okay. that, yeah. Yeah, 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 and that, that so, so back to what I said in presentation, so the reason for using multiple sources of evidence is twofold. One is a sort of triangulation thing. Am I getting the same or different story from these different sources of evidence? Triangulation's a bit complicated and confusing, I think, but that's one reason to do it. I'm getting the same story. The other reason to do it is indeed precise of contextualization. So for example, you may, I don't know, have some organizational data that shows a very strong relationship between, I don't know, uh, and your measure of engagement and say employee absence and it looks really really strong that's great and that's maybe telling you something but supposing you go and talk to people and they actually tell you something utterly different it gives you an entirely different explanation of that relationship or supposing you go and look at the scientific evidence you say that's funny we found this link we looked at the scientific evidence and actually suggests there's, there's like no correlation so why have we found one doesn't mean it's wrong doesn't mean the science is right but it contextualizes the information, it may make you look at it again. So in that sense, contextualization happens when you get multiple sources of evidence. I mean, an example I would give, give to this is, if you go to a city you've never been to before, and you want to get a really good dinner that evening, how are you gonna do it? And typically people say, oh, I'll go on TripAdvisor. Is TripAdvisor reliable? Not really. Or I'm gonna go on Google and look at menus, maybe. I'm gonna ask the concierge, maybe. These are all multiple sources of evidence, each one of which, is more or less reliable or unreliable, but looking across multiple sources, 
helps you understand why you're getting different information from different places and helps you make a better judgment. On it. So contextualizing is absolutely central to, to using evidence and evidence-based practice. One piece of evidence from one source alone is not very useful. Um, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Um, because you brought up like bad information, how are there ways people can identify just flat out fake information, bad information, just... Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I always encourage people to sort of, uh, to not think about things as either true or not true. I try and encourage people to think about sort of likelihoods. Because I think if you get into true or not true, particularly when you get into other kinds of information, science and data, you kind of, you're not going to find the truth anyway. So I think it's going to get people to get to think about probability. So if, for example, the concierge in the hotel tells you this restaurant is wonderful and fantastic, and you also find out the concierge gets a commission for doing it, doesn't mean the concierge is giving you fake news. It just means, mm, yeah, maybe I need to really think about that. Is that reliable? How trustworthy kind of is it? as opposed to you ask a work colleague who's been to the city before, who really likes restaurants, who you've been out with lots of times before, we have similar tastes, that's probably quite high quality. So it doesn't mean that they're true, that's true either, or fake or, or true, but it's about, it's about relativity. And I think the other reason for doing it, it's not, it's not, kind of, it's not sort of being post-truth or anything clever like that, it's simply saying that most of the information we're surrounded by, it's quite hard to establish absolute truth and absolute untruth, and the pursuit of that, in the end, I think is not very helpful. I think it's much more helpful to think about probabilities and likelihoods. On the other hand, if we're talking about unicorns, then maybe. But to many people, you know, little kids, unicorns are real and important. So again, it depends on context. Um, okay, and Gemma has a question. Um, I've heard your criticism on the lack of evidence behind increasing employee engagement mm. as a means to improve performance. Do you yeah. think there is merit behind trying to improve employee engagement in order to reduce employee stress in the workplace? Okay, so what, <laughs> great question. There's two words in there I don't understand, engagement and stress. So, because they're both almost impossible to define, they have multiple definitions, multiple ways of measuring it, multiple theories, they're quite hard to get at. But maybe what's behind the question is, is engagement in some way linked to well-being? Certainly, it might be. There's some, there's some definitions there around that. But again, I think if you're interested in well-being, I would focus more on that. Well, do we even have a problem with employee well-being? What kind of a problem is it? And given if, if we actually sort of find one, what do we know about what is more likely to be effective for, to, for dealing with that specific aspect of well-being? Because there may be very different kind of intervention solutions to different kind of problems with different aspects of well-being. So, so I would say, indeed, something like engagement may link sort of well-being and may even be defined in terms of it. But I would say, if it's a well-being issue, try and focus on that rather than bringing another, another vague concept like engagement. I think that does more to muddy the waters. Than... All right, well, we're pretty much at the end of the hour and that went really quick. <laughs> So I want to thank you, Rob, uh, hey, for, for joining us. I, this was a great conversation. Um, I wanted to let people know that next month we have Sherry Sutton on April 26th. We're going to be talking about appreciative inquiry. And then on May 24th, we have Kristen Sherry, who wrote UMAP, coming on to talk about how to onboard and develop people with dignity. And because she's working on her new book, and that's basically the topic of it. Um, so those are on our event fight already to register for. Um, and again, thank you, Rob, for joining. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. Fascinating. Thanks.